Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 92 with Tyler Ehrlich. Tyler is a currently a doctoral uh, TA in wind band conducting at the University of Texas at Austin with Jerry Junkin. And um, really excited to have you on the program. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So you're now you're now uh, getting your doctoral in wind conducting. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your your history before that as a as a music educator? Absolutely, yes. So I just finished, or maybe not just finished, but back in April, I finished the first year of the DMA in wind conducting here at UT Austin. Before that, I lived in Atlanta for six years. I was a high school band director for five years. I taught at Centennial High School in Roswell, Georgia, Decatur High School in Decatur, Georgia. And um, I also conducted the Emory University Wind Ensemble for three years. And while I was living in Atlanta, I also worked with a community band called the Atlanta Wind Symphony under the direction of David Keeler. So I worked with that ensemble as well. So that was my sort of my most recent professional experience. Before that, I lived in Athens, Georgia for two years where I did my master's degree in wind conducting um, with Cynthia, Cynthia Johnson Turner, who was the director of bands there at the time. So that's basically my most recent professional experience. I'd, I'd summarize it as, as that. And so you made the decision as a music educator. Did you, did you know you always wanted to go back for a DMA? I, y yes, I, I'd say mostly so. Um, and it's so, interesting because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the, I guess the question I had was like to people who may be on that fence as teachers, you know, I, I got a, I got a, a under, an undergrad and a grad degree, but I, I didn't, I was not interested in going on, but I did it all right away because I wanted to, you know, just do it right away. But I know some people like yourself will go teach and then come back for more. So what advice do you have to people who are on that fence? Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, um, I'm totally right there with you. And, and all of those uh, career steps, I think are pretty big life changes. I mean, my, my partner and I moved here to Austin. I mean, we've been together for eight years now, but we've been able to find sort of a very compatible lifestyle living in Athens and then living in Atlanta. And then him and I are both making the jump to move to Austin to pursue professional opportunities here. So of course, when you're considering family and other things of that nature, like that, that very much becomes complex. Um, I'd say it's, it's something that sort of took a while to, to figure out where exactly I wanted to land. Um, I, I knew that it was really important in the collegiate music education, wind band conducting space to have, um, public school teaching experience. And I think that's something that everybody, um, has always advised me to do. So I knew right after I finished my master's degree, I wanted to spend, you know, four or five years at a minimum teaching public school. And I, and I really loved doing that. And I learned so much by doing that. And, and one of the main things that we're going to talk about today is something that was really challenging for me and something that took me a while to sort of fit, figure out a groove in. So I think the biggest words of advice I can offer for folks that are considering it or that um, want to make that jump is to consider engaging with the faculty that teach at those universities and trying to seek out specific mentors that you're interested in studying with. Um, two years ago, I applied for the UT conducting workshop and I got to spend a week here in Austin. I had a really wonderful time, um, but UT wasn't the only school that I did conducting workshops at and, and mm -hmm. connected with faculty at. So trying to figure out who might be a really great mentor for me professionally and personally. Um, and then I was able to find that in Professor Junkin, which was quite wonderful. And then going to the workshop, fostering that connection and then applying to study to do the degree with him. So just trying to figure out ways to build those relationships, I think is really crucial. I remember being being mentioned. Somebody mentioned to me you should consider going back to grad school for conducting, and they said you're looking for three major things. I want to hear if I want to know if you disagree, agree, or if you have more to add as well. Um, somewhere where you're going to get some money, somewhere um, where you'll have podium time, mm -hmm. and somewhere where you can really connect with the person who's you know your main professor. Absolutely, right. and I think that I think I would rank those in reverse order. I think trying to find somebody that can be your mentor is the most important thing. And, and people have differing opinions on this, which is totally fine. But personally, for me, the mentor is more important than institutional clout or anything of that nature. I mm -hmm. think trying to find a specific person that you feel like can guide you um, professionally and help you work on what, what you need to be, because of course, we're all sort of on our, on our own journey with this process, is really important. And then personally with conducting degrees, it seems like most schools are able to offer some sort of assistantship because we have a responsibility to be working with the band area. And of course, all of the setting of the chairs and stands and all of the, the grunt work, but also the teaching of conducting classes, working with the athletic bands, that seems to provide some sort of a financial stipend, at least when I talk to my own peers. And then this, remind me of the second thing, we talked about the money and the teacher. Podium time. The podium time, absolutely. And I think that that's such a crucial question for everybody that is looking at different graduate school opportunities is trying to figure out what are the conducting assignments and how are those made? 
And what opportunities can you create for yourself, whether that's being putting together a pickup group, something in the community, potentially mm -hmm. working with fellow graduate students or undergraduate students. So I think that's definitely a combination of figuring out what sort of laid out for you as part of the degree plan and what opportunities exist for you to just be in whatever city or town that you're in and for you to create for yourself. Am I, am I accurate in my assumption that sometimes at the bigger, more prestigious universities, there's more grad students, so a little bit less conducting time. And then if you went to like, say maybe a B school, you might have more podium time. Is that accurate or not? I, I think it's possible. I mean, I talked to peers at, you know, every, every level school, I would say, and I think it definitely varies. Um, I think it's something that teachers try to figure out a way to do as equitably as possible. You know, I don't mm -hmm. think that they necessarily want to show like they're favoring anybody because of course I don't, I don't think that's, that's quite right, you know, to try to maintain their studio culture as positive as it can be. Um, so I, I think that that's just a conversation that gets to be had, but I'll be honest. I mean, I was, you know, when I was listing out sort of what I was doing while I was in Atlanta, I was teaching three concert bands by myself. I was working with a college wind ensemble and I was working with this community band. So I was probably, you know, like most music educators listening, I was looking at what, 18, 20 pieces of music at once. Mm -hmm. And to be totally frank with you and your audience, feeling very overwhelmed and drowning in the amount of score study and preparation I felt like I had to do in order to be as fastidious and prepared as a teacher as possible. So gosh, that was a really tall order. So to be able to have the time here to actually really pare down and focus mm -hmm. on, okay, I wanna watch every single minute of my rehearsal video twice. And one time I'm just gonna focus on what I'm hearing. And one time I'm gonna focus just on my actual conducting and movement. And to be able to have that time to really refine the craft during the graduate degree has been just so incredibly helpful for me. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to be able to sort of pull, pull that back a little bit because it really lets you have much more of a keen and watchful eye on your own growth as a conductor, which has been for me really huge within the first year. So you've, so you've sparked a couple of questions for me. Um, first of all, you talked about recording yourself in rehearsal. That's something that we can all do even without going to a degree, right? And it's, it's just the amount that we talk and what we're showing and what we're and how we're rehearsing, that's just a huge, a huge thing. Is that something you did before you came to UT? 100%. I mean, yeah. I, I wish I recorded myself um, more when I was teaching high school. I recorded myself a lot when I was conducting at Emory. So I would just set up, you know, a $19 tripod on Amazon and I would put up my iPhone in the back and it had enough of a, a battery to record a 90 minute or two hour rehearsal. And I would watch as much as I physically can, or I could put it when I was, when I was teaching in Roswell first and I had a 25, 30 minute commute, I would just put it on through my car speakers and I would just listen to myself teaching and asking myself, do, am I making sense? Are the students actually responding in the way that I'm asking them to? Are things actually getting better? As you said, how much time am I spending talking versus actually conducting and showing mm -hmm. things gesturally? So having that commute was really a great time for me to be able to reflect on my own teaching practice. I, I, I did a meeting with Phil Edelman a couple episodes ago, a good friend of mine who's a, a professor at UMaine. And he says he has a student in his percussion section who is like his timer. And if he's, if he's talking for more than I forget if it was 15 seconds or whatever, this kid just holds his drumstick up. So if That's he sees great. at the back, it's like a cue to like, stop talking, dude. <laughs> that is so wonderful. Yeah. And it's great that he's able to lean on the student and think about sort of the responsibility that that student feels to get to sort of hold his teacher to that regard. So that's great. The second question I had is, um, what would you do differently? Um, you know, like I know you've mentioned this. So now that you've had a year to kind of step back a little bit and enter it at UT, what are things you would do differently as a music educator? Yeah, what a interesting question and one I've spent more time definitely this year thinking about um, than in the past for sure when I was actually in the classroom on a daily basis. Um, I, I think the first and foremost thing is figuring out a way to encourage students to keep music in their lives beyond high school. I mean, I was very conscientious about, and, I, and I'm imagining that most people are, looking at the rosters year to year, having mm -hmm. converse, tracking down the students that are, why aren't you doing a band? Come on, one more year. And really trying to foster that continuity in their, as part of their high school education. Um, but then something that I really did very passively was actually encouraging students to continue to make music at the college level. And mm -hmm. just trying to really frame a lot of these things as, you know, high school band for most students every day or every other day. It's a huge time commitment. It's a huge part of their academic load. Um, at the college level, I would say most universities offer some sort of non-major band. Maybe they don't offer it year round, but they offer it for a semester. I mean, here at UT, we, we have three or four non-major ensembles that meet in the spring. There are concert ensembles that students are able to do year round, that varying commitment. 
And even if they're not making music every single day, there are ways for them to keep music in their lives. I mean, we offer here, of course, dozens and dozens of concerts just because it's a very large school of music. But really, no matter what campus they go to, there should be some sort of musical organization, maybe mm -hmm. not a concert band, but maybe an orchestra, maybe a choir, maybe some sort of musical theater, maybe some sort of traveling um, performances that they're able to see, like we have something here called Texas Performing Arts, where folks can see sort of Broadway shows that come in town. But just figuring out a way to sort of foster that love of music and art beyond just high school, because I, I feel like that was something that I didn't really push or encourage my students as much as I wish I did. And I think the second thing that I wish I did more of, and that it's, it's hard because I felt very much in the microcosm of, of high school band, but I was really, really, really insistent about every single de musical detail being exactly perfect, 100% correct, because mm -hmm. that's sort of what the culture of being a high school band director, at least where I was living in Atlanta, very much felt like. Preparing for assessment and getting a one, and it has to be done this way, and constantly recording my groups and my teaching practice, and really listening to an excruciating level of detail. And I think that all of that teaches a whole lot of stuff. And of course, I would talk about that with the students and with the community about you know, preparing yourself for um, having attention to detail and preparing yourself for a job interview and being able to um, you know, put yourself out there in vulnerability and all these different skills. But something that I feel like I didn't talk about nearly enough was really trying to cultivate a sense of loving music and loving art and taking enough moments in rehearsal to just stop and say, isn't this a really cool chord in this piece that comes out of nowhere? Or isn't it fascinating how the composer starts with this really big, large texture and then just thins it out to just one solo? and what do you think that that might represent or what does that represent to you? I mean, if you were to create a story to this piece, what does it mean that we went from a major mode that sounds like this and then play a chord on the harmony director to a minor mode that sounds like this and play a chord on the harmony director? So just figuring out a way to not always just focusing on this super minutia, detail oriented preparation that I felt was kind of a hallmark of my teaching because that's kind of what it felt like to me, the culture of music education was where I taught. One other little question before we get into the 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 meat of the upbeat stuff. Um, I also noticed in in kind of reading about your bio that you've done a lot of presenting. Um, am I mm -hmm. correct at the national level with Midwest and CBDNA, and then also yeah. at the uh, GMEA? So my I guess the the question because that that could be forever. We could spend five hours talking about all your presentations. But the question I have is for like what is the benefit for people to present? Because I I'm probably like a lot of people where it's like well I know a lot of stuff but they probably know that too. So like, what is the benefit to yourself to presenting? Well, I, I think that that is an easy trap to fall into. You know, it's like, well, I know this. So I feel like a lot of people know this or maybe, you know, you don't feel like you have a lot of information to share because I think that there's times where, where we feel like that's the case. Um, but I don't think that's true. I mean, even in the conversation that we're going to have, I think a lot of the stuff to more experienced educators, um, may seem kind of obvious or, or well known at the jump or you know certainly that that's the case but i had a mentor um that we actually put together a few clinic applications that we've talked about and it's just trying to frame the these presentations at clinics um where there's sort of three goals number one hopefully you leave with one new idea that you can try mm -hmm. i mean i think that we all feel under the pressure you know most clinics are 50 minutes to an hour not everything is going to be a new is a new piece of information. And I'm sure that you've also left going to clinics and and realizing, okay, well, I, I knew most of that, and that's and that's okay because that's sort of being goal number two, which is confirming something that you already know about. Right. And then finally, the last thing is really just asking or revisiting something, an assumption that you have without judgment. So maybe during the, the course of this conversation, and I and I think that we're going to sort of talk about this, you know, sort of now in the in the meta sense, but maybe there's going to be something that one person will hear that will be framed and will just make them sort of pause and reflect a little bit, not in a judgmental way. And of course, we're not talking down to anyone or being dogmatic about anything, but really just sort of, you know, maybe priming them to think, okay, well, maybe this is something I should consider revisiting. So when I had the conversation with him and I thought about really just trying to destigmatize, okay, well, you know, none of us are the foremost expert on probably anything, but maybe there's something that's a little bit of a new perspective that we're able to share that may help one, two, five, ten people people in the room. And if that's the case, then I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to share that information with the audience. It was funny. You just said one, two, five. And I thought you were, I was expecting you to say one again, like one, two, five, one. And I just, I don't know, the, <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. the, te the teacher in me, I guess. Um, of course. And, and, and I think a big thing too, is to help you is it gets you out of your comfort zone. Oh, totally. I mean, I've learned a lot because when you put these clinic, these, these presentations together, you really have to 
um, revisit everything and, and do a lot of reading and research. And I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did a clinic with composer Viet Quang at TMEA, and we're doing it at Midwest this year on interpretation of wind band music. And that's made me read dozens and dozens of articles and books and, and excerpts and things I could find online, watch videos on YouTube about different presentations. And that's just made me way better in that domain. And I'm, I'm working on some other things as well. So definitely throughout the whole preparation process of working on those presentations, um, I've definitely gotten a lot uh, more plugged in with, with the information that I had to present at, at a necessity. So more people should do presentations. I like it. I think so. I mean, yeah. it's, and, and what's cool is, is like your podcast. I mean, what's great is to have information that's evergreen. I mean, something that I think about often is we'll, we'll put out a clinic or a presentation that will take dozens of hours to prepare. There'll be some people in the room that hopefully get something and then that all sorts of goes away. But with having YouTube and having media online that anybody can listen to at any point, maybe, you know, of course, it, you know, it's June 28th right now, maybe in six months or maybe in a year, or maybe in three years, somebody will listen to this and they'll get a piece of information. And I think that that's really cool and special. Yeah. And there's so many ways you can do that. You know, even if you're on a podcast and you search, um, sleep and then you go, Oh my gosh, here's a thousand podcasts about sleep. And I want to listen to this one. You know, it might be from four years ago, but you're right. I love that. Um, okay. Exactly. So, so I was on vacation with my family in Mexico and I'm reading upbeat for people who haven't uh, read it. You should, it's a very, very motivational book. And in it is all these little vignettes, which I'm not totally sure I know what a vignette is but it's a great word. Um, and at the end of one of these chapters, he, he had you uh, write a, a vignette. We're actually recording this on Matt's birthday, aren't we? I think we are. I think oh. it's his 50th too, which is significant. All right. Let's imagine we sang happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> we didn't rehearse that. Um, okay. So I, I was reading your vignette and it just struck me that this is something that should be the, a podcast episode. So I'm going to read the beginning, and if you can kind of take it from there, that'd be great. Okay. Do we teach music or do we, um, oh, sorry. Do we teach music or do we teach students? I can do this. Okay. After completing my undergraduate and graduate degrees, I began the exciting adventure of full-time student teaching. I was only a few, few days into it before I realized some of these students do not care about becoming better musicians. Yep. To me, this was a huge revelation. While I'd given great, sorry, while I had great musical training, I did not have a single tool in my toolbox to teach students why they should care about making great music. While struggling with the disconnect between my students and me, I also spent time considering the old, age old question, do we teach music or do we teach students? A shift in mindset answered the question and solved the apparent um, artistic apathy. We teach students the art of music, students come before music. Yeah. I remember that moment vividly because I, I remember, um, I mean, and this was, this was 20, fall of 2016, this was, and I remember uh, the band, the band room that, that I was teaching in and the class and the students. And um, yes, it's, it, 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 hearing you read it back to me sort of floods my brain with the memory of that whole <laughs> revelation. I mean, every, all of the experiences that I had before that, and I'm, I'm curious the demographics of folks that are listening, but sir, I'm, sh I'm sure that every teacher has had to consider this to some extent if they were anything like me, which is the person that, you know, was in all state band, was in jazz band, was in mm -hmm. choir, you know, did everything he could do in, in, in high school music, then gets to college, does the same thing, right? Surrounded by people who love music that want to pursue this professionally, gets to graduate school, same thing. Now I'm going from a liberal arts school to a school of music. So there's a few hundred people that have the exact same interests and passions and curiosities that I have. And then going from all of that back to back, now going into, you know, typical high school X, East, East Cupcake High School, we'll call it, and you're teaching your, th you know, third band. The fact that we're, we're ranking them anyway is a whole other conversation. But you're, you're, you're teaching these students, and here I was, you know, 22, 23, so definitely older than sort of your typical student teacher that's often like 20, 21. Um, and finally, for the first time, being presented with this really stupid facepalm moment, which is, oh, not everybody in high school was like me. Not everybody was on all. You know, I was one of two or three kids that made all state band where I grew up. And, yeah, and, and, and you were in the top you were in the top ten percent, right? But you, now as the teacher, you have to connect with everybody. Hundred percent. Talk about a huge like, oh duh, I wish I wish that I <laughs> I wish somebody told me about that a little bit sooner. But of course, you know, experience is the best teacher. So that was a really uh, that was a really big moment for sure. And, and so, the beginning of a big change. So what was the secret? 
Well, you know, as we sort of talked about before we started recording, unfortunately, there is no secret. It's about fostering relationships, you know, and of course, I know this is also another old adage, but people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. So yeah. figuring out. And mm -hmm. the word that you used was connection. That's the word that, that struck out to me that if you can connect with those students, it's then going to be easier to, to do everything. 100%. And there's, and to me, that was the biggest change because all of the training and all of the experience and the conducting and music education classes, blah, 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 all of that focused on teaching practice, pedagogy, artistry, music, music yeah. exactly. None of it actually focused on building, People. you know, I didn't take a class in college, none of us did, and building relationships or connecting with today's adolescent. You know, I don't remember that course offering existing <laughs> when I was a student. How useful would that have been, right? But that's where I found resources like this. I mean, this book didn't exist at the time, but that's where I started to figure out, okay, I need to figure out a way to foster relationships with teenagers, which feels like a really weird and sort of calculated thing to say. But I think we just have to call it what it is. Building a connection with the students is the key to being able to actually teach them anything about music. So, so let me sort of ask you a follow-up to that. The question is how, like, what are some ways that you use to foster those relationships? I mean, I think the most obvious one is trying to find space for actually having a conversation with our students. I mean, most of us, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining we're, we're, this is a band podcast, so we're probably looking out to a sea of, what, on the smallest end, maybe 10, 15 students, and on the largest, who knows, 75, 80 students. Mm -hmm. How many of those kids do you actually talk to every day beyond saying sharper, flatter, louder, softer, longer, shorter? That's not really a connection. That That is you telling them what to do differently and then hoping that they make that change or insisting on them making that change. So we have a responsibility and a need to figure out actually how to have those conversations with kids. And maybe, you know, I mean, if Harry Wong, the first days of school or, or whatever the name of that book is, I mean, I remember reading that, you know, standing at the door, saying hi, giving every student a fist bump on their way mm -hmm. in, saying good morning, saying good afternoon, having open office hours, having your door open during lunch. I mean, sure, we, everybody wants a little bit of peace and quiet, maybe if they have a 20, 25 minute lunch break mm -hmm. during your day, but figuring out ways to be able to foster conversations specifically with students that need it the most. And that's the students that don't come to you and want to be the drum major or want a leadership position or want to audition for the Allstate Band or something. It's the students that are a little bit quieter, or maybe English isn't their first language or they're a little bit more introverted. And it's just really going out of your way to give them some space. So you mentioned the greeting every student at the door. I have a, a, a teacher or a former student who's a teacher now, and she came back after student teaching and she's like, so when you were greeting us at the door every day and saying hi to us and having two seconds, was that you connecting with us? I was like, yes. She goes, oh my gosh, now it makes sense. So you're right, whether or not you have like a personalized handshake for every kid or you have, you know, just a nice way to say, hey, did you win the game yesterday? How did it go? Or, you know, how are your parents or whatever? You're right. That connection is huge. And I find that that even just three seconds with each kid on the way in, you you foster that through the rehearsal. Um, I also wanted to mention there's a lot of other ideas that I got from uh, an educator and composer named Michelle Fernandez. I don't know if you know Michelle, um, but I had her. She's from Florida. She's a great, great writer and, and clinician. And I did an episode with her in, I think it was September of 2022. So it was a little while ago. And it was called The Emotionally In Tune Band Director. I've had a lot of people respond to me that that has been their favorite episode. And um, she talks about all these ways that she was able to like emotionally get in tune with her students. And there was things like, you know, movie nights on Friday night. And I'm like, movie night? I just need to go home and sleep. But she did it, you know, have, having, a, having a pool table in the band room during lunchtime with strict rules, you know, like all these things that I would like, wait, what, wait, what? And um, she's, she's like, no, I got all the buy-in from the kids. And then the program just took off. So that if people are looking for more ideas, and I'm interested to see if there's anything else that you did as well that, that uh, might have fostered those relationships. Um, but that's a good resource for, for people as well. Absolutely. And I, I mean, all of those, those suggestions sound great. And I, <laughs> I can't imagine some, some, some back alley gambling or something. Of course, I would never <laughs> assume that that would be happening, but I, I, it does, it does make me giggle a little bit. Um, I think, and of course, as you mentioned, you know, oh, I, I just want to go home on Friday. So trying to hold all of these things in tension with one another, like, like doing all those activities takes more time out of our incredibly busy schedules and potentially time away from friends and loved ones and other activities that actually let us recharge our batteries to be able to foster those relationships with students. 
I mean, something that I did, and this was this was from Matthew. I mean, having that having that gratitude wall and having slips next to it and having students write. I have a photo of it somewhere. This was back. This was this was my my old band room where it was big enough to actually have a gratitude wall. Mm -hmm. But having slips of paper where it said note of gratitude and students could basically just fill one out and put a student's name and, and staple it up there. And isn't that so great? And, you know, I mean, I think about sort of those students that, and this is heartbreaking to say, but can, can potentially get a little bit lost because they're so quiet and because they're so introverted and because they're always on task. I mean, it's always easy for us to figure out, or it's not always easy, but it's our tendency to figure out, okay, this student has a tendency to be disruptive. So I really have to solve that relationship or foster that relationship, whatever you want to call it, to be able to build, to, to be able to sort of solve this classroom culture issue. I use all those quotes because I realize that some of that is a little bit problematic to say. But the students that are just always on task and are just quiet, and maybe it's really hard to foster that connection, mm -hmm. start, you know, having that gratitude wall and saying, I'm really grateful for student X because she's always on time and because they're always doing this. And, you know, that student's going to smile because they're going to feel acknowledged and they're going to feel seen and heard and know that you're thinking about them and caring about them. So that's an example that might be a little bit more, a little bit easier than putting the pool table up. And maybe a, maybe a QR code um, little just check in. I mean, I know that this is super mainstream now, but having students just do a little exit slip or do the QR code and say, how are you doing? What's going on with you? And that way, you know that you're, I mean, assuming every student's doing it, which you may need to figure out a way to track, but mm -hmm. that way you actually know you are trying to foster that connection with a student. And we're not sort of lulled into this sense of just because they're in my classroom and because they're doing what I'm telling them to do, that means that we really have a connection with them. And I think another way that you can lead kids is the old, what's the old adage, you can't lead anybody before you can lead yourself. So that sort of brings me into the thought about, um, you also started talking about ways that you developed and continue to grow your own competence as a teacher. So what are, what are some of the, I mean, obviously you went back to school, so like you're clearly, you're clearly doing that, but as a teacher, when you were in the public schools, what were, what were some ways that you kept your self improving? Yes. And there's no, I don't get any kickback of these. There's no discount codes or anything, but I did go to, I met Matthew at the Consumer Institute a few years ago. I got a scholarship through um, a fraternity that was able to fund my trip, which was, which I was super grateful for. Mm. And um, it, it was, uh, you know, four, I think it was four or five days um, on a super cool little small college campus. And that's where I met Matthew and I went to his sessions and I thought, this is the guy that I need to talk to because he was somebody where everything was about student centered, everything was student centered and everything focused on building relationships. And that was a major shortcoming for me as, as sort of a young teacher. So going to a workshop, workshop like that, going to a session, and of course his handout at the back of it has a list of, you know, bibliography, recommended readings. And, you know, I, I, pulled these off my bookshelf just a few minutes before we connected, but reading books like, you know, Angela Duckworth's Grit and tried to figuring out how to share that information with students or here's um, Talent is Overrated, another mm -hmm. great read or, or The Culture Code, which I think is really huge. And then of course, this one is a little bit less centered on that, but, the, but Dick Floyd's Artistry of Teaching and Making Music was also a great read. So besides reading Matthew's book, and, and I was, was looking through it as, as we prepared for our conversation as well, but he has a giant what he calls bibliography and inspirational reading lists. Mm -hmm. So all of the, those were really great resources. And I mean, I talked about my commute briefly before, but using Libby or, or purchasing the audio book on Kindle or Audible and listening for, for 20, 25 minutes. And when I was um, when I was an assistant band director at my, in my first job, my colleague and I would, would um, we did summer reading. I think we did Culture Code, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, in preparation for this leadership camping retreat, which we put together, which was an awesome experience, also a heavy lift, you know, we talk about sort of making sure that we're, we're giving ourselves enough space and room. But um, he he and I both did the audiobook and had a lot of conversations about how do we apply some of these lessons from Culture Code into our program. And uh, there, there were also contributions that were in the vignette and upbeat, but they were incredibly helpful in figuring out how to sustain and foster those relations with my, with my students. And then therefore, everything just got better after that. I'll also say I'm I'm not not to promote what I'm doing, but I think the podcast realm is an amazing opportunity for people because, you know, I mean, if you think about it, any podcast that would have to do with your edu your educational job, whether it be a music director podcast or a culture podcast or, or wellness or anything, I mean, those are on demand all the time on your phone while you mow the lawn. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. So I, I think podcasts work really well 
for that sort of growing as a band director uh, a lot. And then at the end of your vignette, I was noticing that you started talking about how you created more leaders in your band. And again, that's something I'm trying to improve at as well. So I just want to give a quick start on this. Perhaps the most significant thing you changed is holding leadership training year round and most importantly, as a component to our band camp. We discussed our three band goals. What were those goals? Yes, so they, they did change between between my the two schools that I worked at because I wanted to make sure students felt heard in making the goals. Okay. But this was when I was teaching in Decatur. So they were love like family, lead with positivity and strive for mastery. And, and I wish that um, I had a photo of my band room, but I actually got a poster made, um, two posters made, one right in the entrance to the band room and then one right next to the front of the room. So they were very um, predominantly displayed. And this was at, at both schools that I taught. They had distinct goals, but um, basically the way, so let me, let me start the story by saying that this is another Matthew Arau recommendation. And this sort of came about because I felt like once again, I knew what was in my mind about sort of what I wanted students to be thinking about, what I want students to know, how I, how I wanted students to act, which feels very controlling, but you know, sort of the, the classroom culture and, and the mm -hmm. rituals around what we do. But I did a really bad job of telling the students that and how can we possibly hold the students to a standard at which we don't really articulate and share mm -hmm. with the students. And I think most importantly as well, and, and I think that we see more of a, um, more a shift in this recently is, I mean, I'm just personally, getting on board with this idea of culturally responsive teaching and um, understanding uh, pedagogical tools that feel more relevant today versus the more authoritative and like dictatorial um, structure mm -hmm. that I think that some of us were, were brought through. But giving space for students to actually come up with these things, come up with, with how they want the, the classroom to feel and what they want to prioritize throughout their learning. And the way that I did this, and this was really at Matthew's recommendation, but worked worked over COVID during virtual school time, worked, of course, in person, worked in two very different schools that I that I worked at. And that was this idea of breaking students up into groups and asking them, what's why do you do band? Why do you love band? Why do you keep coming back every single year? What's important to you? And they would brainstorm a huge list of things. And some of those were things that I thought had more meaning than others. You know, none of the goals are win a trophy every year, get a one, get a one at, at festival every single year, mm -hmm. because to me, that's nowhere near as important. But instead, this idea of striving for mastery is a way that we can actually talk about always trying to do our best and something that continues in that vignette is not, is only one person can be the best if you can even really rank them, mm -hmm. but everybody can do their own best. I like the word so the mastery. Way that, the exactly. word mastery is and that's word, a, yeah. That's a David Vandal Walkerism, another sort of Georgia icon um, from the whole from a pedagogical and teaching standpoint. But the the idea behind the goals was was exactly that. So during leadership training, so this was something in particular that happened right before um, my staff and I went through the leadership selection process. But it was meeting with students and saying, you know, exactly what I said before: what do you want the classroom to feel like? What do you want to prioritize and everything? Breaking them up into groups. Then we would come together from those groups and I would do this on you know, a Google slide or a Google doc or something and just write down everybody's goals and ideas and, and things that they wanted. Then I would go through and bold what the similarities were. And what I found, and this was, this was different, there was definitely overlap between the schools, but there were differences. Like for example, my second goal, this idea of leading with positivity was something that came out of the fact that um, the classroom environment that I inherited was not always centered in positivity. Mm -hmm. And you can, and, and something that I would talk to my feedback, my students a lot is this idea that feedback can really be an emotionless thing. Like if I'm telling you you're flat, that's not a personal attack. That's just telling you that you're a little bit flat. You're a terrible person. Didn't... Exactly. <laughs> and trying to divorce that idea for students, because I think a lot of them feel like they have to be perfectionists. And of course, you know, I try to normalize failures and talk about my own struggles and challenges as a teacher. Um, but bringing students in and saying, okay, well, something that everybody is talking about this is that we want to be nice to one another. So what does that that mean? It means, well, let's consider what a family was like. Maybe doesn't everybody always get along in a family environment, but at the heart of it, we know that we're a team and we're ones that have to love one another. So that's where that first came, goal came from. So just trying to have those conversations with students about what are common things that they say, that they feel, that they realize about how they want their program to look. And I think maybe surprisingly, they're very aligned with ways that we want our classrooms to look as well. So going from there, trying to unify those goals, 
and then putting them on a poster and providing yourself with the, with the opportunity to say, if something, if somebody says something that's rude to one another saying, you know, we're not really loving like family right now, or if someone is doing some sort of sectional teaching or something and they're being a jerk saying, that's not really leading with positivity right now and mm -hmm. providing that sort of built in, I'm gesturing to my, my printed uh, poster with my goals, but gesturing towards saying, you know, this was sort of the common agreement that everybody had, not just me as the teacher. So what are ways that we need to model that? And I think the fact that it comes from them as much as you is, is a huge piece of that. Um, and I, I think some people struggle with the positivity and being honest, you know, cause it's, what do they call it? Toxic puff is positivity or what? I don't know if I totally know what that means, but you know, saying something's good when it's not good because kids can read through that too. And to me, if you focus on the growth mindset, you can be really positive while being honest with them as well. Talking about, you know, okay, that's improved from yesterday. It's not where you're going to be yet, but you know, if you're honest with them, but also positive, you can walk that line, you know, cause honesty doesn't mean negative. 100%. I agree. And feedback can be an emotionless thing. And I, and, and that's something that I really try to impart on my student leaders as well. And just in my own teaching practice. So I, I totally 100% agree with you. Sometimes I wish looking, going back to the part of the conversation about what, you know, what, what would I change? Sometimes I wish I drew more attention to things that were going really well with my students. I felt like I was always sort of in that fix it mindset. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say, you know, wow, that was the most in tune we've ever played that, or that was the most unified that we've ever played that. And just really draw these, these um, draw attention to the, the, the wins that we get to celebrate. 100%. Why can't we be happy? Why can't you just go, we just did 99 things. Amazing. We all have to focus on the one thing that isn't done yet. Yep. And we all struggle with that. And I still struggle with that in my yeah. own, you know, as a, as a yeah. you know, young professional or whatever you want to call it. Call and, and, and how do you, do. how do you, because we, we want to get better at those things. So how, how are you grateful and positive, but also striving for improvement as well? That's just a balancing act. And I think just being aware of it, it's, it's a huge, a huge portion. Um, I agree. So I had a couple questions that I, I, I'm guilty of this. I actually just came up with, decided I wanted to ask you today. Not that they're revolutionary questions, but I did not prepare you for this. So hopefully this goes well. I'll knock on some wood here. Um, so thinking about some recommendations from you, both about composers and pieces. Um, I'm wondering, can you give us a couple pieces that you think people should know about? And I, I'm not going to say no to like the grade six or grade five, but, you know, kind of like a wide range of a couple pieces or one piece, you know, something that maybe you think doesn't get played enough or people need to know about more. Yeah, for sure. Um, the first one I'm going to say is one that I just did with our, with our non-major band. I mean, of course, these are, you know, college students, you know, at a, right. at a really flagship university from Texas. So I, I understand that that can sort of paint a picture about, okay, well, hold on. But, but truthfully, um, I feel like I wish I knew Maslanka's illumination earlier. Yep. Me too. Okay. So that's one that you know as well. Well, I'm, I, I just learned about it from Onsby Rose like six months ago. I had never, it was even commissioned Perfect. close here and I'm going to use it next year. So good. What a great, and what I love about that piece and what I was sharing with the students, this is going back to that, you know, not just sort of the fix it mindset, which I think a lot of us live in, but I'm a huge Maslanka fan and my Wi-Fi password for the past 10 years has been Maslanka 4, which is a very nerdy confession. Hopefully nobody in my apartment building actually listens to your I podcast. I love that piece. That. Yes. But um, <laughs> what's so what's so cool about um, that piece is that it introduces all of those Maslanka tropes, like the hocket rhythms that get passed and forth, the melody that the, those chorale melodies that get played in augmentation. Um, and I, I think that uh, it just, it's such a cool way to introduce students. And what's great is, is sort of that that can serve as like a stepping stone to maybe doing California or maybe doing Give Us This Day or something that, that more people know about. Um, and, and there, there are more rigorous pieces by him. So I love that. I, I wish more, more great folks piece. knew that piece. Yes. Um, I think another piece that is, a, that uh, technically is easier, but I think is a, would be a great fit for a lot of high school students is called Big City Lights by Marie Douglas. Is that a piece that's gotten talked about yet? I've never heard about that piece. Okay, so um, I think that, that that should be playable by a lot of high school bands. Uh, Marie Douglas is from Atlanta, um, and she utilizes a lot of like trap elements. Um, there is like an electronics track, so mm -hmm. that can be like a little bit tricky, but it's just a start stop. Like you don't need Ableton or anything particularly involved to be able to use that. Um, but what's cool is that I think that that, you know, specifically being from Atlanta, it's great to really actually pull in some cultural elements by somebody that lived in Atlanta from Atlanta mm -hmm. um, into the classroom, because of course that sort of hopefully will 
D like Eurocentric our, our curriculum a little bit because we, we, we do present often a very sort of narrow view in, in wind band literature. Um, has Stillwater by Kalijah Dunton got talked about? No, I know the I know the piece, but we haven't talked about it on the podcast. Tell us about it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've never done it myself. It's on my wish list to do soon. But um, another piece that I think technically is not too challenging, which is great for our students, because that lets us focus on what I think that piece does really well, which is just beauty and wonder and awe. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 got those it's got beautiful clarinet writing and sort of this beautiful corral feel to it. And I think that it allows us to teach expressivity and artistry um, in a way that is not going to be limited by technical demand, which is, of course, something that everybody, I, I think, struggles with. So I think those are the three that I'm, that I'm going to awesome. share out right now. Yeah, I hope um, that some folks listen to those and, and play them. That's perfect. I know I'm going to listen to them again. Um, a couple, uh, Big City Lights, I don't know that at all. I'll have to check that out. Yes, um, it's a new one. It's a new one. So so you, you should bring it up to the Northeast, I think. I mean, right. bring it bring it from Georgia up. It's made its way to Texas already. So I'll, I'll listen. It's time I can't to go wait. East Coast. Um, good. Very good. While you're talking about that, you you actually made me think of two other pieces that I think kind of fit in with it. So I'm, I know I asked you, but I'm I did not intend on just giving my own impressions. But another one that fits that Stillwater sort of piece to me is "Safely Rest" by Nicole Puino. Um, it's mm. um, it's on Amazing Grace, but it's so different than the the traditional tune. It's so good. And then there's an arrangement of "Make Our Garden Grow" from Candide. Um, which is done by, I think, Joseph Krines. I think it's a grade okay. three or whatever. And it's just one of the most gorgeous pieces of music uh, ever. Those are pretty great too. So I love that. Well, I'm going to have to check out your um, your Make Our Garden Grow arrangement because I, I don't know that one, but I would, I, I'm, of course, I love Candy and I love Bernstein. So I, I, have, on I, have one, I have one pet peeve on that. I don't know if you, send me a message if you agree with me. At the climax of it, there's like an octave jump in the lead, right? And I think because it's at a certain grade level, it's from concert A flat and trumpet, but they don't let the trumpet go up to the high A flat. So they like concert mm -hmm. A flat up to the F. And to me, it's like totally robs that moment. And I'm not putting down the publisher or anything like that. It's just one of those, you could clearly go, okay, that's supposed to be this, but they moved it down. So I know when I do it, my trumpet, my first trumpets will have no problem with the octave. So we're just going to change it to the, the octave anyway. I, but I think that that is totally fine. You know, and some, who even knows who made that edit as well? I mean, that can open up a whole right, other conversation right. about interpretation. But yeah, I was just, um, where did I hear this from? I forget. I was on, I was doing a podcast with somebody and they, I feel, feel bad now. I don't remember. And they said, why, um, you know, people listen to this famous Frederick Fennell recording of the second, first movement of something Von Williams or Holst, I forget. And now everybody started playing it fast because of that. And then they asked Fennell about it and he said, I wouldn't, couldn't get it on the record if I didn't play it faster. So the only way we could get it recorded was to do it faster. I would never do it that fast. So I think having some of that artistic license is probably a good thing. I hear you. Agreed. Well, Tyler, thank you. Appreciate it very much. This has been great. Of course, Kyle. Well, it was a pleasure to talk and um, I'm just going to plug one or two things if I may. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, some, some of the resources that I've talked about, um, I've already shared, like I, when I left my classroom, which is really sad to say, but when I left Decatur High School last year, I wanted to have sort of like a central rep rep repository of a lot of these leadership presentations and slide decks and handouts and book recommendations and things. So um, my website is just my name, tylerehrlich.com. Um, and there's like three buttons at the top. One of them says blog. I write like one or two blog posts a year, but if you click on blog, one of the one of the links is going to take you to something. There's actually two. One thing is called like high school leadership marching band resources or something, mm -hmm. and all of that marching band stuff that can be taken out, and it could just be concert band or potentially even choir, orchestra, mariachi, jazz that could be focused in whatever medium you're teaching. And then another one is a slide deck that I did um, when I was a guest at Oklahoma State University last year, and that's on like a, a, a big variety of topics like pacing. Um, classroom culture, mm. things of that nature. So those are two posts that have like slide decks, handouts, book recommendations um, that people can check out. And then I'm also going to plug my own podcast for a moment. It's with the yeah, Texas Career it. Engagement Office. Yes. And um, basically my colleague, Ogechi Kazu and I um, interview folks that work in um, alt-ac or alternative to academia spaces. So these are the folks that work with community ensembles, that work in social media, that work in things beyond just the classroom. And you get to hear from some folks that you already know and love, like Viet Quang, and some folks that are going to be new to your listeners as well. So that's going to be wrapping up just at the end of this summer, 2023. 
Um, but hopefully those resources can help some of your listeners. And I'm always down to connect if people want to connect on Facebook, Instagram, via email, I'm always down to chat. So feel free to reach out. And is there anything that, that's coming up maybe this summer or next year at UT or something that you're really excited about? Well, we have a really, I can't spill the beans yet because I don't think anything's been published, but we have a really, really incredibly exciting concert season with um, University of Texas Wind Ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, so that all of those concerts are completely free to stream. So if folks go to music.utexas.edu, um, the Wind Ensemble does three concerts in the fall, three concerts in the spring. Folks are more than welcome to join us virtually and check out some really exciting rep, some of which people know and love, some of which uh, is going to be new to new to some folks. And I think that both of those are going to be really exciting. And we do stream the Wind Symphony and we, we stream the Symphony Band as well. And the, the piece recommendation, Big City Lights, was programmed by the Symphony Band. So it's possible even if you think, okay, well, we're not all going to be able to play Maslanka 4 or whatever, mm -hmm. there are going to be pieces that you're going to hear and you're going to think that will be a really great fit for my students. And I think that that's just such a great way for us to engage with the medium and work on our own professional development. So check us out. And we do have our conducting workshop every summer. Um, next week, I, I, I'm not sure exactly on the date, but if folks go to music.utexas.edu or Google UT Conducting Workshop, they can check that out. And we'd love to have you in Austin. It's a great week of music making, teaching, and learning. So we'd love to see you there. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.